Well, hello everyone, Ani, and welcome to today's webinar, uh, Electric EV Infrastructure 101. My name is Benjamin John, and I'm the Climate and Energy Programs Manager for the Georgian Bay Minidogami Biosphere, as well as uh, today's facilitator. Also joining us today from the Biosphere is Allison Covert, our Climate and Energy Programs Coordinator, who will be leading all of the tech in the background. So if you're having any issues with Zoom, Allison will be able to help you. Please know that we will be recording today's session and posting it to our YouTube channel. We really just want to make sure that this session is accessible to those that aren't able to join us today, um, but also offer you the opportunity to review any of the topics uh, that were discussed. The link will be circulated in a follow-up after the webinar, and it will also be made available through our website as well. We'd also like to encourage you to use the question and answer tool function that Zoom offers. Um, if you have a question at any time in the webinar, please put it in there and we'll do our best to get uh, back to it in the time that we have. But before we begin, I'd like to take this moment to acknowledge the land on which we are on today. The Georgian Bay Biosphere is situated within the Robinson Huron Treaty of 1850 and the Williams Treaty of 1920 and located on Anishinaabek territory. Our organization under UNESCO acknowledges the rights of indigenous peoples in this territory and works towards respectful and reciprocal relationships as we're all caretakers of the land. So again, thank you everyone for joining us this, this evening. As mentioned, my name is Benjamin John. Um, if this is your first time hearing about the Georgian Bay Biosphere, we are one of 19 UNESCO World Biospheres located in Canada. This biosphere in particular, it stretches 200 kilometers along the eastern coast of Georgian Bay and was designated by UNESCO in 2004. And our, e our region is ecologically unique as it contains the largest freshwater archipelago on Earth. As an organization, we are a registered charity with an office located in Perry Sound. And we rely on grants, partnerships, and donations to carry out the work in the fields of environmental conservation, climate action, sustainable communities, culture, and education. It's our goal to help inform, educate, facilitate, and provide leadership within these areas as a way to inspire collaborative partnerships for learning and action that build towards uh, balancing humans and nature within this Georgian Bay Biosphere region. And I'm really excited to share with you today that today's webinar is part of a larger webinar series and overall project that's focused on electric vehicles and sustainable transportation. And we'd like to thank the Mike Brigham Foundation, Lakeland Solutions, the North Bay Perry Sound District Health Unit, as well as some of our other partners who have made this webinar possible tonight. If you enjoyed tonight's webinar, I would highly encourage you to head over to gbbr.ca slash events and register for some upcoming webinars that we have as well as future events. Uh, we have some great speakers lined up for these and whether you're an EV expert, have some knowledge already, or are really just beginning to uh, learn about electric vehicles, there's gonna be something for everyone at these sessions. I'd also like to mention that our friends uh, at Climate Action Muskoka are hosting an EV car show at the Bracebridge Fairgrounds on May 27th from 10 to 1, where they'll be showcasing different types of electric vehicles. And the Biosphere will also be holding a sustainable transportation event on August 19th in Perry Sound, where you can test drive different models of electric vehicles, as well as e-bikes. Uh, you can interact with EV chargers and ask experts and owners any questions that you might have about these. If you're interested in attending and learning more about either event, uh, please feel free to reach out to me after today's session. But to start us off, I'd like to start by putting a poll out there just to better understand how familiar everyone is uh, with EV chargers and better understand how visible EV chargers are in our community. So in a moment, you should see a question uh, and some responses appear on our screen. There they are. Um, and as I mentioned, we, we want to know if, do you know where public EV chargers are located in your community? Um, and I'll give you a few moments just to put your poll in there.
just give everyone one more second here. Right. So I'm not sure if you're able to see what the poll results results are up here, but um, what we're seeing is that just over half of responses that we don't know where EV chargers are located in our communities. Um, and that's, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm confident that through today's session that we'll be able to provide you that information, um, but also might encourage you to know that we, in, in Perry Sound anyways, um, there are quite a few public EV charging stations, and there's a lot of efforts within the broader Biosphere region to expand charger infrastructure as well, too. So, um, I'm, again, I'm confident that uh, some of these of your questions will be answered through today's session. So, without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce you all today to our guest speaker, Kara Clareman, uh, President and CEO of Plug and Drive. Plug and Drive is a nonprofit organization that's recognized leader in the electric vehicle space, focusing on accelerating EV adoption through outreach and education. Uh, for over 10 years, Plug and Drive has developed a number of award-winning programs to encourage consumers and fleets to make the switch from gas to electric. Kara herself has more than 25 years of experience working in the environmental and sustainability fields, including 12 years at OPG, initially as their environmental lawyer and later as their vice president of sustainable development. Kara was the 2017 recipient of the Women in Renewable Energies Woman of the Year Award and the 2021 winner of the Al Cormier EV Leadership Award from Electric Mobility Canada. And she also lives in a two EV household with a Chevy Bolt and a Tesla Model 3. So Kara, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Uh, I'll pass things over to you. Thank you so much, Benjamin. I really appreciate the invitation. I'm so happy to be here. I'm just going to share my screen. And you'll just let me know that you can see that okay, maybe with a thumbs up or... Yep. Awesome. Okay. Well, thanks, as I said, um, and Benjamin kindly introduced. I'm Kara Clareman. I'm President and CEO of Plug and Drive. I'm going to just spend two minutes on who's Plug and Drive and then get right into the topic at hand. Uh, so we're, as Benjamin said, a nonprofit all about EV education. We're just trying to help accelerate adoption. So we do lots of virtual events like this. We do lots of in-person events. Uh, Benjamin and I were at a big in-person event today doing test drives with trucks, actually. Um, so we do test drives for companies and for communities, and the whole idea is to give people a chance to try these vehicles with um, no pressure to buy anything. Um, and of course, we do some research as well um, and some consulting, but most of our work relates to consumer outreach and education. Uh, we do this a couple of ways. We have our bricks and mortar facility, which is like a test drive center, imagine sort of science center meets car showroom. And it's a place you can come and test drive EV. So if you haven't had a chance and you are going to be in Toronto, you could uh, make an appointment and come test drive some of the latest makes and models. We also bring our road show um, to you in the local community. We're doing test drives all over the province and beyond. Um, so that's a way to try cars right in your hometown. Um, we do have some stuff coming up. If you're in the Georgian Bay area, we do have some stuff coming up soon. So you can check our events page for that. And finally, we offer a sort of a third option, which we call the meet the mobile EV education trailer. And that is sort of a hybrid between our bricks and mortar facility and the road show trailer doesn't really do it justice. It's a beautiful sort of pop open facility. And it's like having a little discovery center in your own uh, city or town. Uh, we come there uh, with this trailer and a bunch of makes and models of cars to test drive. And we like to plunk this down for closer to a month to give uh, folks a really great opportunity to test drive cars. Um, so if you're interested, please don't hesitate to reach out to us about that. And of course, as a nonprofit, um, we would be remiss if we did not um, 
thank our sponsors for all their support. Without them, we couldn't do all the things that we're doing. So we do um, appreciate them very, very much. Okay, so I always like to start my presentations with a little bit on climate change and why electric cars make so much sense. So you might be surprised to find out that transportation is actually the largest emitting sector here in Ontario. Um, and so that means, of course, that we really can't achieve our climate goals if we don't tackle transportation. It's the number one emitter. And actually in most jurisdictions, not just here, uh, but all uh, across Canada and all around the world, uh, transportation is usually number one or number two uh, in terms of emissions. So really, really important to bring down those emissions if we're serious about addressing climate change. And here in Ontario, we have a particularly great opportunity to do it because we actually already have a pretty clean grid. Uh, here, we are running our electricity grid mostly on nuclear power, uh, as well as hydroelectric and a little bit of renewables, um, uh, a little bit of natural gas. And natural gas is the only fossil fuel left on our grid. You may remember that about 15 years ago, we actually had a lot of coal power running in Ontario. And in fact, um, our uh, coal power fire, our coal fired power plants were the number one emitter in Ontario at the time. And so electricity has actually gone from probably one of the most significant climate change problems to one of the solutions, which is sort of inspiring when you think like in 10 to 15 years that was turned around. Natural gas is the only fossil fuel left on our grid and it tends to only run at peak time. And when I say peak, I mean electricity peak. So it means like, what's the time when everyone has things running, which tends to be the middle of the day, sort of two to four, two to five in the afternoon all the buildings are running and all, you know, everyone's running air conditioning or heat. Um, and uh, that's peak time and natural gas turns on easily and off easily. So it actually tends to run only at the peak and then it doesn't run much overnight. And when are you gonna plug in your car? You're probably gonna plug it in overnight. And so actually when you plug your car in overnight, you're plugging into like nothing is zero emitting, but into almost zero emitting electricity was natural gas is barely running. So almost an entirely GHG free grid. So a really great opportunity to take a huge bite out of transportation emissions by switching to electric cars. So in addition to dropping those emissions by more than 90%, uh, if you make that switch, uh, there's a lot of other benefits to driving electric that that aren't just related to the environment. So one of the questions we used to get, though, was, well, you know, I'm interested, but there isn't a make and model for me. I'm waiting for Toyota. I like a pickup truck or an SUV. Um, these were a lot of reasons people used to give. Now, the great news here is that there's so many new makes and models coming out every week, it feels like, every month. And in fact, um, every brand has one out or planned and many brands have more than one. Uh, many different types of pickup truck, uh, van, uh, SUV are all um, either available or becoming available in the next six to 12 months. So a very exciting time. We have more than 50 makes and models available in Canada today. And by this time next year, we'll have over 100. And so this issue of like, okay, there isn't a mo I like the idea, but there isn't um, something that's going to suit me or my family uh, is probably not the case if it is at all, um, not for much longer. Um, the other one that used to be a big concern for people was range. And rightly so. A lot of the early vehicles had a pretty short range. They were more little hatchbacks that had maybe 150 kilometers, 200 at the most. And especially for people who live more rural or remote, that didn't seem like enough. Um, the great news here is a lot of the ranges have really improved. Most of the vehicles being made today have at least 300 kilometers, but more likely four to 500 kilometers in range. And so that's getting to a point where it's not an issue for people, for most people. Most of us, in fact, the stats will tell you that 80% of Canadians drive 50 kilometers or less a day. And so um, really an EV can meet the needs of most Canadian drivers. 
Sure, it might not be able to meet the needs of every road trip you've ever taken, but just think about the frequency that you do those type of road trips. Most of us, if we're doing a very significant road trip, we might do that once or twice a year. And so it's not a regular occurrence. And so for people who are hesitating because they're thinking, oh, I like to do this big trip once a year or once a year I pull a boat or once a year I take a gang to you pick the, the you know, the camp or cottage. Um, what I would say to you is don't pick your vehicle based on the 1% of drives, pick it based on the 99%. And on that 1%, rent a car, swap with a friend, take a train, do something else, and don't let it stop you from switching. Uh, there's so many benefits and so many savings that it's worth it uh, for, for that one or two times a year. And finally, to what I think is one of the most uh, important benefits is the fact that you're actually going to save a lot of money. We hear from so many people, oh, I love the idea of an EV, but they're just so expensive. And what we need to help people understand is, yes, the upfront cost is a little bit more. If you're comparing apples to apples, it's about five to $10,000 more uh, for the car upfront. But you're going to save at least $2,000 a year on fuel and probably more, as well as a lot of savings on maintenance. And uh, because EVs are just simpler and have fewer moving parts and don't cost very much to maintain. So you're going to save uh, easily over the first couple of years of ownership. You're going to make back whatever extra you paid, and then you're going to be in the money going forward. So we really have to help people understand that, yeah, you're going to pay now to save later, but the total cost of ownership is going to be lower in an EV than in your current gas car. Even uh, a Tesla Model 3 actually over its life is cheaper than a Toyota Corolla, for example, over its life. And so um, just, you know, not to let that upfront sticker price kind of scare you off, do the math. And if you want a way to do the math and you're not sure really how to calculate that, we have a really great calculator on our website. You can go to, you can either just go straight to plug and drive uh, .ca, that's our main website, and you'll see uh, a tab for find your EV match, uh, or you can go to this directly. It's a microsite, ev.plugandrive.ca. And what you can do is you can enter in your current gas car, how far you drive, uh, you know, all your specifics of your lifestyle. It'll ask you a couple of questions, very easy to use. And then you can compare it to any EV on the market and it will produce a nice graph for you of the savings you can expect to have over time. And you can see based on your own driving, how much money you're gonna save. Uh, so I really encourage you to try it and compare a few EVs to your current gas car and see if it's gonna be worth it for you. It, it's, it's worth it for most drivers. Okay, now today's talk, we wanna focus in on EV infrastructure. So some of you might already know a little something about the cars. If you don't, there are so many resources on the Plug and Drive website to help you learn about the cars. Um, but I'm gonna spend my time primarily on charging. Um, although please like, don't hesitate to ask me questions on any topic relating to EVs. Um, but I want to make sure you're familiar with the lingo of charging EVs. And basically, it's very simple, but there's basically three levels of charging available. Uh, one, two, three. Uh, level one, that's basically, think regular old 110 outlet, the same outlet you'd plug in your phone or anything else. Every EV on the market can charge using this kind of outlet. So if you have an outlet outside of your house, that you plug your holiday lights, you plug your weed whacker, your lawnmower, whatever. If you have an outlet, you're ready. And all the cars come with a cord set like shown in this picture, a cord that comes with a car that plugs into 110 and plugs into your car. And so you're basically set up. Now the downside of this is it's quite slow. So it only picks up about eight kilometers of range every hour you charge. And you might think, oh my gosh, that's way too slow. Well, it depends, right? If you're someone who only drives 30, 40 kilometers a day, all you need when you get home is 30, 40 kilometers. 
So that's going to easily happen over a couple of hours. Now, um, also, let's say you're driving a plug-in hybrid like a Chevy Volt or a Ford C-Max or a Honda Clarity or an Outlander. All these cars are plug-in hybrid, which means they have a small battery for plug-in, and then they run on gas. And that small battery can easily charge on 110. So you don't need anything more than this. So I often suggest to people, if they're not sure, you don't have to rush into buying something. You don't have to rush into buying a level two charger. You can try it on this. You have this. If it's too slow for you, I would say if you drive 100 kilometers a day or more, um, this is going to be too slow for you to char fully charge back overnight. So especially if you have buy like a Tesla with a big battery or a, a Bolt or, you know, anything with 400, 500 kilometers, that's going to be slow for you. So then you're going to look to level two. And when I say level two charging, uh, that just think dryer plug, stove plug. It's just the same as a dryer or stove plug. It's a 220, 240 amp plug. Uh, and it can easily, uh, volt, sorry, plug, and it can easily charge your car overnight in a couple hours. So uh, basically you pick up about 30 kilometers uh, an hour of charging. Any uh, licensed electrician can do it. And basically this charger attaches to your uh, level two outlet some cars will actually just charge with a level two you just need the face plate like a dryer plug face plate and some of them will plug straight into that you can get that or you can get something hardwired into your wall but either way they, they'll charge um about 30 kilometers an hour and you know this is all most ev owners use most of us do not use much public charging we're charging at home every night using this uh Ontario price uh, time of use price is very cheap to charge overnight. If you're plugging it at home, it's going to cost you about two to four dollars to fully charge overnight. So it's very affordable. Um, even if you charge at level two out and about at the mall or at stores, let's say you're in a condo and you don't have charging at home, it's going to cost cost you probably two dollars an hour ish. That's around. There's no regulation of these prices, so they can charge what they want, but most of the level two chargers are either $2 an hour. Some of them are just like five bucks flat rate. They vary, but that's approximately the price. And a lot of people ask me, okay, well, will, is this standardized? Like, will this plug fit every car? And the answer is yes. All the, all the brands of car have the exact same plug that you plug into the car except Tesla. It's got its own. It's, um, you know, we sort of joke, it's the Apple of electric cars. It has its own thing. But um, you can get an adapter uh, for a Tesla so it still can charge on one of these. So um, we do sell these on our website. Uh, we do it just to make it convenient for people. Um, it, it, we have all different makes and models of chargers. So if you're thinking about a home charge, you can take a look there. Okay, what's level three? So level three, think fast charger, quick charger, DC quick charger. These are the names you hear. Tesla calls them superchargers. All it means is fast. These basically you can pick up a minimum of about 250 kilometers an hour. Most of them, it's much faster. Um, most of them now you can pick up about 300 kilometers in about 40 minutes, most of them. Um, and, uh, typically you're going to stay there 30 to 40 minutes. You're going to pay about 10 bucks for a half an hour. They're more expensive because these stations are more expensive to, to install. Um, and so maybe you're going to spend somewhere between 10 and $15 full of, for a 80% charge. Most of the time on level three, you only charge to 80% because the battery charging really slows down after 80%. It doesn't make sense to sit there and wait. So most of us will just go to 80% and then move on. Um, so, so that's how these work. Now, by the way, if you do have questions, uh, there's going to be a question period at the end. But if you have a question now that you just think of, you can go ahead and put it in the, in the Q&A 
uh, of, of the of Zoom and um, I can try to get to it as we go. Okay, so those are the levels of charging. In terms of the wands for these level threes, there are two different standards plus Tesla again is, is different. Tesla's the same for level two and three. Uh, level three is unique for the rest of the cars. Some of them use something called CCS and some of them use something called Chatamo. <clears throat> Typically it's the Japanese cars that use Chatamo and the rest European and American use CCS. It doesn't much matter for you because most chargers have both of these on them. So it, it doesn't, you know, it's not going to affect you that much. You will check on uh, Plug Share, which is the app that help you find a public charger, make sure that it has what you need. But like 98% of the chargers have both. So it's not usually an issue. As I mentioned, Plug and Drive has a charging station store. If you do want to get a home charger, it's just a great place to kind of compare your options. You know, let's say you have, you know, you're, you're depending on what car you're getting, you have a very long driveway, you need a long cord, you want one that plugs in that you could take if you move, let's say you rent or you're not planning to live there very long. Anyway, these different options you might want to consider. So, um, you know, you can uh, go to the store, there's a comparison feature, and then you can also call our office and we're happy to answer any questions you have about, you know, which one make, makes the most sense given what kind of car you're getting. Okay, so this is where I think people have the most concerns uh, is the public infrastructure. Now I can tell you uh, that most of us who drive EVs, most of us charge overnight at home. That's the cheapest, it's the most convenient, but, you might go on a road trip and you might need public charging. You might drive different places for work. Or you might live in an apartment or condo where it's harder to get a home plug. For any of these reasons, you might be more reliant on public charging. And so there are two main apps that people use to find public charging, Plug Share and Charge Hub. They're very similar. Uh, Charge Hub is made by a Canadian company and Plug Share is made by an American company. Um, this photo comes from PlugShare. Uh, they're both equally good. So, um, you know, it's just sort of a personal preference thing. Um, what I would tell you here is these are really amazing for figuring out your route. So basically you can go on here and you can enter the route you're going to drive and it will tell you the stations that are going to be near where you're going. Um, when you look at this picture, you can see the, the there's orange and green teardrops. They each represent a charging site. And the orange is level three, so the fast charging stations, and the green is level two. And so let's say you're on a road trip, you want level three because you're in a hurry. Um, but let's say you're just going to the mall and you want to know if it has chargers when you're there, then you're looking for the green, level two. So you can actually filter out certain chargers if you don't want to see them. Let's say you only plan to use level three, it's a road trip, you can filter out these green ones and you won't even see them. Now, one thing I really encourage you to do is play around with this a little bit before you go on a trip. <clears throat> it's always smart to look at this the night before because you see that orange teardrop that's right in the middle of your screen, it's got a little wrench in it. That means that station is being installed or being repaired, it's not operating. And so you don't want to be counting on a station that's not operating. And so I always recommend you go on it the night before, you look at the stations that are sort of in the, you know, the time frame, the place that you want to go, you click on it. When you click on the teardrop, you're going to get a drop down like you see on the left here. It's going to tell you the address, the price, where on the site you're going to find the charger, like is it you know, on the level three of the parkade, because, you know, what if it's in a parkade? You need to know exactly where it is. You don't always be searching around. It'll show you pictures of how it's going to look. And it will also tell you what brand of charger. And uh, in a minute, I'm going to explain why that might matter to you. And so this is really good to do the day before. The other thing is it has a check-in feature. And so you can go on here the night before and you can click and you can see, oh, somebody used this yesterday and it was working well. And so you can have confidence it's not broken or being, you know, nothing, you know, it's not been under repair or anything like that. 
So I always do that. It's a small thing to do just before a trip to give you the confidence that you can go and use that. And sometimes you might go on and say, oh, this one's really fussy. I couldn't get it to work with the app or this and that. You know, you might choose something else. So it's really smart, smart to do that. Um, almost all EV drivers keep these apps on their phone and use them often. Now, um, I saw in the little survey that Benjamin did at the beginning that a lot of you aren't sure where the chargers are. Well, of course, nobody looks for chargers if they're not driving an electric car. So it's not surprising you don't know where they are. These are not like corner gas stations that are neon signs. They're usually small. They're behind buildings. They're sometimes in parkades or underground. So you wouldn't necessarily know. Um, so I'm showing you this map. This is the Georgian Bay region. Uh, just to give you a sense that actually there are quite a lot of chargers in the region and more all the time. And you see there's a mixture of level three and level two. Um, so I hope this might give you some confidence that you could drive in this region and you'd be fine. Um, so um, you can click on a few of these dots in your free time and see like, oh, okay. Then a lot of these sites, by the way, have more than one. So um, there's more than 60 stations uh, around the Georgian Bay area. And so, um, yeah, and by the way, there are more than 20,000 across Canada and about 5,000 uh, in Ontario. So growing all the time, by the way, every month they add at least 50 stations. Uh, so, um, you know, this is this is an, this issue of like, okay, I'm going to be stranded or something. It's really going away as an issue. Now, is it perfect? No. Do we still need to do work? Of course, yes. Um, there's still a lot of more remote locations that don't have anything. Uh, but I think for most of our driving needs, it's it's getting it's getting there. Um, and you know, I'm happy to to discuss that further in the Q and A. Okay, I mentioned uh, earlier that you might want to know what brand of charger when you're checking on PlugShare or Charge Hub, what which um, station you're stopping at. So <clears throat> a lot of these chargers, it's great. There's all these different networks. These are just some of them. Um, it's good in the sense that it's growing and there's more all the time. I, you know, I don't want to paint a picture like everything's perfect. It isn't. It's gotten a lot better. Um, some of these chargers don't take a Visa card or a MasterCard. Some of them you need a special card. Some of them you need an app on your phone. And so now I'm kind of a creature of habit. I tend to use the same few networks every time I go somewhere. But what I would do is if you're like feeling a bit, you know, concerned about this, before you take the road trip again the night before and you click on the spot and you see, oh, it's it's a IV charger, for example. You'll download the app when you're at home at night, not having to like figure this out standing in front of the charger. Download the app, get it all figured out. Make sure you put some money in there. It kind of works like a Starbucks app where you like load some money and then you spend it at the charger. Uh, and then you're going to have an easy time when you get there. Um, and you can see which ones actually take a visa or not. Mo most of them, honestly, they don't. Most of them don't. Uh, so, so you'll need to figure this out. Um, now, remember, you're not doing, I hope this won't discourage you. Like, I've been driving electric car for 12 years. You, I'm not doing this often, you know, unless you're someone who's driving to, like, different work sites all the time or always going to different places. Most of us go to the same places over and over again. Gr grandma's, hockey, you know, the same trip, whatever, uh, cottage, whatever, same places. And so this is, you're going to figure this out one time. Not not a hundred times, so uh, don't don't let it uh, deter you. Okay, um, because you know I know a lot of folks are still just learning, and and uh, I just thought it might be worth it just to spend two minutes on the cars. I spent a lot of the time on charging, and uh, you know I just want to emphasize the variety of cars that are available and the price the prices. You know, so people say, oh, the cars are so expensive. Well, you know, the Chevy Bolt comes in at just under 40 grand. The Ionic about 45, the Tesla about 65 now, actually. They, they, um, they've they changed the pricing all the time on the Tesla. And now there's rebates on all of these. 
actually there wasn't a rebate on the Tesla for a while. Like the all wheel drive one is a little bit higher price, but now they've changed the, the rebate structure. So some of the Teslas actually qualify. So you get $5,000 off on any of these. So, you know, you're not, you're, you're in around you some as low as 35 and, and, and even less. So just to keep you uh, up to date on the fact that, yeah, new might be possible for you. Maybe you didn't realize there were cars in your price range. And I also just wanted you to know that even if a new car, maybe you're someone who never buys a new car and you're someone who's like, you know, this is either not in your budget or just something you don't like to do. There actually are a lot of used EVs available. And so I encourage you to look if you're thinking about it. You can find them on Auto Trader or Kijiji. You can also find them at the Electric Vehicle Network. They rent and sell used EVs. I love them because you could actually rent it for a couple of weeks and see if it works for you. And then you could buy it if you like it. And, you know, a test drive is great. That's what we do. Um, you know, but sometimes 10, 15 minutes isn't enough to sell you on it. Maybe you want to like, try a week or two where it's like i'm going to do hockey i'm going to do groceries i'm going to do all the things i normally do and you can see if it works for you and if uh if it does then you know you're going to go into it a lot more confident and that's a pretty low level investment to do a rental for a couple of weeks you know you're going to spend a little bit of money instead of you know a, a big investment so if you're interested in that i can put you in touch with the ev network they're really great and they'll find you the car that you want. Even if you're very fussy and you have a very specific car in mind, you're looking for a 2020 Bolt with a black interior and a gray exterior, whatever, they, they'll help you find it. Um, they typically go to the auctions in the US and they can get all sorts of EVs and you'd be surprised what's available. The biggest question I get on used EVs is concerns around the battery life and that, you know, well, if I buy a used EV, am I going to have a problem with the battery? And all I can say on that is if you are concerned about that, there's tests you can do on the battery to make sure it's good. And you can also um, buy a car that the warranty on the battery is still good. Most of the automakers give an eight year warranty on the battery. And so you could buy a three year old, a five year old car. And you still got a few years left on the warranty. So should you run into a problem, you won't, you know, you, it won't be your problem. Um, so those are just a few tips for buying used. I have a lot more to say on used. Um, it's a whole webinar on its own. But um, if you are interested, um, you know, I encourage you to look at these uh, websites. Okay. Um, I'm going to just spend two minutes on, you know, medium and heavy duty. Um, just to let you know that actually there's a lot more available than there used to be growing all the time. The event that Benjamin and I were at today had test drives in both of these vehicles, the Ford F-150 and the Ford Transit Connect. Um, and then it had uh, the brake drop and the Lion Class 6, which is a huge truck. Um, it was really exciting to see all these vehicles coming to the market. There are actually 50, again, different makes and models of medium duty available to buy right now in Canada. I know some of them are on a waiting list, but there's quite a lot available. And if you're interested in medium to heavy duty, uh, Electric Autonomy has a great list of all those trucks and, um, and buses, et cetera, that are available. And uh, it's not just uh, cars and trucks. Uh, we're also electrifying boats. Um, the first ferry boat in Canada is being deployed in the ferry from Kingston to Wolf Island. If you ever do that, it's a really fun thing to do in the summer. Um, ride the first uh, Canadian electric ferry, super cool. And then there's a bunch of speed boats that have come out in the last couple of years. I mean, our lakes are going to be cleaner and less noisy. And these are just amazing. Right now, they're kind of pricey. But the prices are coming down as we get more into a mass market. The prices are going to drop even more, and these are going to become commonplace. And I wouldn't be surprised if it won't be long before we start seeing uh, bans on um, gas boats because these are so much cleaner and nicer um, that and, and available now that I think you're going to start to see uh, more and more uptake. Okay. Buses. Um, 
in your area, there won't be too many, but there are probably going to be some shuttle buses. Um, but there's school buses coming out electric made right here in Canada. Lion Electric makes them in Quebec. Um, we see them being deployed across Canada. Uh, the TTC, which is the Toronto's transit system, has bought uh, hundreds of electric buses. And uh, just at this event we were just at, Brampton was showing off their electric buses. Go just bought a bunch of electric buses. So, you know, this is happening. I mean, you know, we used to say it's like a matter, not a matter of if, but when. And now it's just like, how soon will the when be? <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, it's speeding up. It's going to be sooner than we all predicted, I think. Uh, so pretty exciting times and great for um, our air quality because actually buses, diesel buses were huge, huge emitters. So uh, it's good for everyone. And in particular, the school bus, the air quality inside school buses was atrocious. And most of us as parents, we just didn't know. Um, and so this is just a better option for our children. Okay, so how are we doing in Canada in terms of adoption? You know, not bad, not as good as some other countries, but we're doing okay. We're up to about, you know, 8% um, uh, new car sales across Canada, that's average. That's because British Columbia is up around 20% and Quebec is not far behind them. The rest of us are kind of down in the doldrums. Uh, you know, the prairies are like, you know, 2% and uh, Ontario's hovering around 7%. So, um, you know, we're getting there, not the best, but not the worst. Uh, we are improving year over year, about 40% uh, improvement a year, which is which is pretty good. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of things to be hopeful about. There's been announcements about incentives, about more money for infrastructure from the federal government. Uh, they're providing incentives now on medium and heavy duty and support for school buses. And they've just launched a huge clean electricity grid initiative for provinces that haven't cleaned up their grids yet. And uh, so lots of good things uh, to say like, hey, it's happening. Um, but we, um, we've, where Ontario has done extremely, extremely well is on manufacturing. There's been more than 10 major EV related commitments announced just in the last year or two. Uh, in the billions of dollars, you know, including the Volkswagen battery plant, a battery plant in Windsor, um, GM Bright Drop in Ingersoll, uh, Ford is going to make EVs in Oakville, Honda in Alliston, and it goes on. Um, we don't know what brand exactly of EV all these folks are going to make. Uh, some of the announcements are still a bit vague. But um, it's all good news for electrification and will make the vehicles more available, which is really important. Um, and so that's that's really promising. Uh, where maybe we aren't doing as well is in the actual you know, adoption. Um, we, we are falling behind a lot of other countries. You can see that the big adopters are China, then Europe, then the US. We're hovering around 10th, which isn't bad given the size of our country. But um, we're way behind a lot of other countries. And the reason is, you know, we just don't have as good EV friendly policies as some of them have. Uh, even compared to the states now with that um, Inflation Reduction Act, we're quite far behind them. So uh, we'd like to see some policies that could level it up. Uh, the government's made a bunch of announcements, but nothing is enacted in law yet. So we're still pushing for that just to make sure it happens because um, it's great to say we're going to do it, but we'd like to see it actually happen. And we know we can do better because Norway is all, all up around 80% new car sales. And so it's not a mystery what we need to do. Uh, we can just look at what other countries are doing. Many, many countries doing much better than us in terms of adoption. It's a combination of incentives, you know, free driving in HOV lanes, a free parking in major city centers. Uh, you know, um, penalties for driving gas guzzlers. There's all sorts of things that governments can do if they want to do them. And so if we want to speed it up, uh, you know, there are things that have worked elsewhere that we can just look to those countries and learn. We don't, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Okay, so basically we've covered a lot of this. Uh, you know, we're doing well on manufacturing, doing okay on infrastructure. We can do a little better, but we're doing pretty good. Education, we can do a lot better. I mean, I'm doing stuff like this. There's other groups like 
uh, like mine, doing uh, outreach, test drives, all this. But thankfully, the federal government's now funding education, which is great. But we need to, you know, really ramp it up. Uh, companies can do more. We don't always have to look to the government to do things. Governments can can help, but companies can put in chargers at work, can encourage their employees, can do educational events, can convert their fleets. And so there's things companies can do to show leadership. And we don't have to be like always waiting for the government to do something. Um, so, you know, I would say what would be be the most helpful? I'd love to see the building codes updated so that a new condo or apartment doesn't get built without chargers being considered in the in the parking garage. I'd like to see incentives on used EVs. That would be amazing. And we need the ZEV standard, which the federal government has promised and I hope will deliver on. Um, and this is my last slide. Um, we talked about the environment. We talked about saving money. Uh, we talked about, you know, the clean grid. We talked about infrastructure. What often gets forgotten is the public health benefit to all of us if we switch to electric cars. And a study was done in the greater Toronto area. If you're interested, you can look at it yourself. It's at clearingtheair.ca. And it basically modeled out what would happen if the whole fleet in the GTA was converted to electric. And basically it would save hundreds of lives. It would save millions of dollars in social benefits because it will prevent hospital visits, asthma, emphysema, all sorts of lung problems. Our cars actually do cause a lot of air pollution and sometimes we forget that, particularly in city environments. And so um, each car actually is worth almost $10,000 in social benefits and we don't even count this. So um, just one more reason for you to consider making the switch. Um, if you haven't had a chance, as I said, please go to our events listing. We will be near you, or if you're coming to Toronto, you can book an appointment with us. We'd love to offer you a test drive, no pressure to buy anything, just to learn. Um, so take it, check it out. And um, I'm really uh, pleased, as I said, to be invited to be here, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, thank you Kara. Yeah, the ask you mentioned the uh, EV Expo that we were both at today, and it was, uh, I agree, a lot of really incredible different models there, everything from the small to the to the heavy duty, as you mentioned, too. And yes, even when it comes to charging infrastructure as well, too, we're seeing uh, a lot of quick growth in our our region as well, too, in terms of charging infrastructure. So highly recommend everybody, too, to go on that plug-in uh the plug share website and really kind of zoom in closely on where you live in particular and see what's just in the general area. Um, so if everybody could uh, put their questions in the Q and a chat, I see that we have a few already. Um, Kara, do you want me to just read those out to you and then, or do you want to Actually, I, I can see them, uh, Benjamin, I've, I've got that open so I can, I can take a crack at a few of these. So the first question here from Brenda, if I have an EV charger at home, can I delay the charging to happen off peak? Yes. And it's really, really easy to do. Uh, most of the cars have an app and you can just do it through your car. Your charger doesn't have to be smart. In fact, if you're just using a regular old outlet, the car is smart enough that you can set it to uh, only charge off peak. That's what I do. Uh, most drivers do it. And in fact, with this new ultra low price coming, you're definitely going to want to do that. So, um, so the answer is yes. Um, do some of the apps for public charging work with each other? It's a really good question. So PlugShare is an app and, and ChargeHub, they map all the chargers. But I think what you're asking is more like, you know, if you're making a payment system and all that, like, is there a, an app that can use more? And the answer is yes. Charge Hub has started to do that, where there's three or four brands and you can just put money in and it will work with all of those. But it's not all the chargers yet, but, you know, it's going there. It's kind of like, remember before there was Interact with the banks and you had to go to your own bank uh, to take money out? Um, and then all of a sudden you could use your bank card to all the different types of banks. Um, the same thing's happening here and uh, it will happen. But right now we're up to, I think, three or four brands you can do it. And the rest you have to have their own, their own app. Um, 
can I use my EV as a generator for my home if the power goes out? Well, the answer is maybe. Um, there are a couple of brands of EV that are already uh, able to do it. Uh, and that's right now the Nissan Leaf and the Mitsubishi Outlander, the Japanese cars, do have the capability to do what's called vehicle to grid or vehicle to home. Um, and then you need a special type of charger to be able to do it, not a regular charger. The regular charger only sends power one way. There's a V to G type of charger um, or a super smart charger that, that can do it. So you have to get that uh, and then you could, and then you could do this. More and more of the cars are going to be able to do this over time, um, but right now only a couple of brands are set up are set up for it. I don't see any. Are there more questions than that? I do have oh, a couple. Uh, oh, yeah. I yep. see them now. I see them now. So how soon can we expect bi-directional charging? Well, there's a bunch of pilots going on right now. Um, there's one in Toronto, like with some big buildings. In fact. At the conference that we were just at, there was a little tour where you could go go to see this pilot that's going on. Um, and then there's like some pilots with homes that Hydro One is doing. Um, so <clears throat> how long it will take till it's like available to everyone? Hard to say, but I, I do have hope that it will be like within five years. Uh, but, but right now it's just very much pilot phase. Um, could you comment on the fact that GM discontinued the Bolt? I have a Bolt too, and I love it. I mean, I was actually really disappointed when that happened too. Um, for some reason, the OEMs, especially the American ones, you know, are going to all SUVs. I think, you know, this is what they think people want. They think people want big vehicles, and you know, maybe a lot of Canadians do want big vehicles, but there are plenty of us that would like small vehicles. <laughs> so, uh, you know. I'm with you. I wish I had more I could say or do about that. Uh, I was disappointed too. Sarah, I have a few questions that uh, myself that I'm, uh, I hope you might be able to answer. Um, when we were talking about level three chargers and, yeah. and we mentioned that they were going about 250 kilometers an hour in terms of charge. Yeah. When we get into level threes, do we see different speeds of level three yes. chargers? Yes, that's a really good point. So I didn't I didn't get into that, but level threes are not all the same. Some are faster than others. And like, so for example, the Tesla superchargers are very fast and even some of the other brands are faster than others. And so when you go on plug share or charge up and you're looking, you can look at that. There is some information on that. And if you're in a hurry and you wanna get like your, you wanna pick up 300 kilometers in let's say 15, 20 minutes, you've gotta go to one of these uh, ultra fast chargers and the information will be there so you can, you can choose it. More and more are being converted to be faster than the early ones. I, you know, there's no um, hard and fast rule, but what I'll tell you is the older stations that have been in there for more than five years, they're going to be slower. And uh, one, one last question for myself as well, too. If we're looking to the future and we're seeing, you know, a lot of rapid adoption with electric vehicles and as people are say looking to perhaps stall two ev chargers in their homes is there a way that we can say s install two ev chargers on one circuit so we can minimize the amount of uh you know electrical panel yes. upgrades that we have to do yes. in our homes there are like different technologies with power sharing um and power management where it's like one will go on and one won't and vice versa. Um, I mean, we're a two EV household and we just share one charger. Um, I think for most families that'll work. I mean, depending on your space, uh, sometimes it's a bit of a hassle because we have to, you know, pull one out and pull one in, but um, we do that just because, um, I don't know, it's simpler, I think, but um, I think there will be families that would like to have two wands and then you could, split the charge between them if you want them both to charge at the same time there's there's brands out there that can do all that and maybe it's uh maybe it's a conversation too for condominiums 
for example, where oh, something definitely like that an makes issue. Sense. Definitely an issue in multi-unit, and there's all sorts of cool power sharing, power management technologies out there now to make sure, like, because you know what the building operator might say is like, oh my god, like this is gonna like fry the building, like this is the demand's gonna be too high. We say no, we're just gonna we're gonna give everyone their charge overnight, but we're not running everyone all at the same time. It's gonna if you just plug in, then it's gonna work its way through all the cars and um, and the, the chargers are smart and they know how to do that. Right, and I, I think we have one final question, just oh, being cautious of time. Um, we'll take that final what question. And again, if there are- Has the, the, the ultra fast chargers, is that what you meant? Um, actually, a lot of the different companies have put in a few ultra fast chargers amongst their other chargers so there isn't really a brand other than tesla that has like only fast super fast ones so if you go to ivy for example at an on route it's typical that they'll have one like super fast one and the others will be medium fast <laughs> so you just have to pay attention to the, to what it says on the charger about the speed right well, thank you. Thank you for your time today, Kara. We really, really appreciate it. And if My anyone pleasure. has any additional questions, uh, Kara's contact info is up on the screen here, but you're also welcome to reach out to myself in the biosphere at any time with uh, any additional questions as well. So thank you everyone for joining us today and, and have a good evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, Benjamin. Bye, Allison. Bye. Thank you, Kara. Pleasure.